Hello and welcome back and today what we've got is part two of my run through of the anonymous Tarot de Paris um, published by Grimaud, edited by André Dimanche um, it's a it's a copy of uh, an early 17th century probably tarot deck currently held at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris pre-Marseille uh, what we would now call a pip deck and in my last video we looked at the majors comparing it with uh, the majors from the um, Conver 1760s deck um, obviously much later if we think this is round about 1600 uh, but I'll be saying a little bit about more, more about that later in the video uh, today we're going to look at some of the miners. I won't walk through the entire lot, um, but let's get started by looking at the rather interesting Ace cards. So in the top row here we've got the Convert Aces, um, coins, batons, cups and swords. And down here we've got the uh, the Paris Aces coins, batons, cups and swords and I'm not sure if you can see on the screen very much detail as I said in the, the last video the, the stenciling on some of the cards in, in the Paris Tarot in the original seems quite clumsy and we, we've lost a lot of the lovely engraving that's underneath the, the woodcut engraving um, but what we've got here on each of the aces uh, there's an animal um, and the animal in each case is carrying a banner um, and on the banner is the symbol of the suit, the card suit. So here on the um, Ace of Coins we've got a lion to start with, here's the lion's head and he's standing up on his hind paws there and his front paws are holding the um, flagpole. There's the flagpole, there's the flag going swirly things that the flag does there and there on the flag is the is the symbol of the coins so very very different from what happened later when the Marseille pattern came along here on the suit of batons we seem to have a griffin um, because we've got something that looks probably like a lion's body but with wings um, can't quite make out what's going on with the face. A classical griffin would have um, an eagle's face, um, but that's probably the, the 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 beast that's there. On the suit of cups, we've got a stag. There's the antlers. There you, are, you see, and and again in its front legs, it's holding the flagpole with the cup on it. And finally, in the swords, we've got a unicorn with huge great horn that goes almost off the card there rearing up on its hind legs and holding the banner um, with the sword on it so that's the aces um, I don't really know what the 16th 17th century symbolism around these creatures is obviously we've got two real life ones the the lion and the stag and two legendary ones which are the griffin and the unicorn but beyond that, I don't know very much about how, what symbolism may or may not be going on in, in here and why the, the creator of the deck chose these particular animals. That would be fantastic for someone to look into. Um, and if I happen across any, any references to it somewhere else, I shall, I shall let people know. One of the features of uh, Marseille decks when they came along um, beginning in the middle 17th century and going on to the Conver in, in the mid 18th is that um, the usual thing was on the Two of Coins card there's this sort of um, band that joins the two coins together and the maker's name would appear on this band. Here we see NAS for Nicholas Conver 1760 
on on the band there and that was that happened way before this it's uh, it's a fairly common thing on decks but here on the Paris Tarot it's very odd the maker has four opportunities to advertise themselves and they don't take any of those opportunities here on the two of coins you have Fête à Paris Par made in Paris by blank same here à Paris Par blank Fête à Paris Par blank Fête à Paris Par blank very odd um, I think basically there are two things that could have happened here. One is that the cards were engraved and maybe also stenciled, though probably not. And space was left for um, the maker to run the print again with their name in the empty spaces. So the cards were made blank and the maker would add, add their name later. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that the cards were made with the maker's name in. Later another card maker has come along and either bought or otherwise acquired the, the printing blocks and has erased the previous maker's name from the cards and then not put their own in. It's unusual. Um, one way or another that's missing, which is why it's, we call it the anonymous Tarot de Paris. Um, so it's either made this way, maker's name goes in later and that was never done, or it was made with the maker's name and that's been removed. Those are the possibilities. That could have some implications on the dating of the cards because of course if it's been made with the maker's name then it's at a later time that somebody has come along and removed the maker's name and reused the printing blocks. Um, and what we have here is essentially a reprint of the original blocks but with the maker's name erased. So that's that, those are the possibilities around this strange anonymity in this deck. Next I'm going to go through the court cards and do this fairly briefly because um, after we go through the first lot of court cards there's not a lot more to be said beyond that. Um, just to notice the difference between the uh, 1760 Convert court cards and the Paris court cards down here. Um, the names in French in the boxes along the bottom are the same with slightly different spelling from 150 years earlier. Uh, valet becomes Valet, um, Chevalier is the same, Reine becomes Rouen and, and the King's the same. Um, slight oddity here in the little box above the card image um, we could see here some initials CD is obviously Chevalier de Denier uh, for the Knight of Coins but the Valet de Denier gets FD and that seems to be Fante di Denari which hints at an Italian or maybe a Spanish origin for the cards um, originally and they, they were later labelled in French. The images themselves are very different um, first thing to note is in all of the court cards in the Paris Tarot the King and the Queen are standing, not not seated. Um, okay, yes the Knights are, are all on horseback, we'd expect that. The Valets, um, the Valets in, in the Marseille Tarot and on virtually everyone since are always depicted as young people. Um, here in the Paris Tarot they're all bearded men um, which suggests someone slightly older than this. Um, there's also much more of a prevalence of 
armor among these characters in in the Paris Tarot. Here, the the valet, uh, the, the page of coins, the valet de denier is is armored, and we'll see that in some of the other um, some of the other court cards as well. Uh, I mean, to my eye, probably the most similar here is is the chevalier, the the knight of of, of coins. But even here, you see, his, his horse is rather more energetic than his his counterpart in in the the Marseille. Um, he's also not carrying this club, which has always been slightly confusing in in the uh, Marseille Tarot. Because when you look at it and don't look at the label, you think, "Hang on, is that batons or coins?" Uh, you know, it's mildly confusing. But here we see a rather different image, and the kings and the queens are like we saw with the. Empress and the Emperor, they're in these rather more dynamic poses. It looks like the, you know, in the act of going somewhere rather than just being seated somewhere. So those are the coins. Here are the court cards of the batons. Um, first thing I notice here is that, um, again, the knight is in a much more um, dramatic looking pose. That uh, if you can see under the stenciling colours. That's a beautifully engraved horse that he's sitting on here. That It really is a lovely piece of engraving this. Um, so yeah, much more energetic pose and turned slightly away from us. Uh, the other thing I notice in particular about these uh, batons, courts, cards, a apart from what we've noted about the King and the Queen being standing instead of throned and things like that, is that in the Marseille deck where you see the 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 club the baton um, becoming progressively more refined between this tree branch that the valet's got and the this sort of um, embellished wand that the king has instead of that what we have here is it, it, the baton looks the same for all of them um, there's no progression there so here are the cups a uh, couple of things to notice here. Here again, um, the the valet is now turned, has completely has his back to us. He's facing completely the other way. Um, so we're, we're looking at him at the back. The knight is facing the other way from from this, and again we've got the same as before: king and queen, unthroned, and again, obviously in the act of going somewhere. Even though they're looking back here, they're obviously going in in in. A forward direction. Finally here are the courts for the suit of swords. Um, this is a nice image, the, the page of swords here with a massive sword that's as tall as he is, um, looking slightly awkward, just as the page in the Marseille Tarot is looking slightly awkward but in a rather different way. Here we continue this theme of some of the figures being facing away from us with we can't see the face of the of the Knight of Swords at all, but what we can see is his horse's backside. Very odd pose there, but there you are. Um, and again, this very dynamic figure. He's got his sword raised back over his shoulder as if he's about to bring it right down on somebody in front of him. That that's a very energetic pose. And similarly, the 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 Queen there with a raised sword and the King drawing his sword there. Very. Uh, energetic figures there, um, rather warlike, rather um, they mean business this lot. Finally I just want to look at a, a, f a few of the pip cards here, um, beginning with some of the coins. Now a feature of the, the coins in the Tarot de Paris is that I don't know whether any of the patterns are repeated but we've got a huge variety of images on the coins themselves throughout the, the, the suit and what they are is they're either depictions of sort of family coats of arms or they are images of actual coins of the time. Now a really interesting thing here is if you look at the tarothistory.com discussion forums there's a thread there from about 2011 I think um, if you search for something like um, Tarot de Paris date or something like that you, it, it'll come up and although everything we've said so far puts this 
deck of cards in sort of the, the first half of the 17th century. There's a discussion there um, where the contributor looks in in detail at the the images on the coins, at the at the suits of at the coats of arms on the coins, and he puts them forward as evidence for a much earlier date for this deck, and the date he homes in on is 1559, very precise. Now 1559 is just a couple of years after the Catlin Geoffroy deck to which the, this uh, anonymous Tarot de Paris deck bears some striking similarities. Now I'm not enough of a historian to know how compelling the evidence presented there is, but there it is, that's, that, that's some evidence for the uncertainty about the date of these cards, that at least one person has seen some evidence to put, put it as early as 1559 even though it's widely taken that it's perhaps 40, 50, 60 years later. Um, one thing we might say at this point is possibly one thing that argues for a later date is the card backs. Now if any of you have seen um, Jean-Claude Flonois's um, edition of the Jean Noble tarot from 1650, the pattern on the back is the same. Now. If that's accurate, that the Noble Tarot has this pattern and this deck has this pattern, I think it's a bit odd that people, the printers, were using the same tarot back woodcuts in 1559 and nearly a hundred years later in 1650. So we just don't know. Um, but there's evidence uh, both ways, apparently, to put it as early as 1559 or as late as sometime in the first half of the 17th century and it all comes down to these incredibly detailed images on the coins. Um, the only reason I'll look at the cups, well, a couple of reasons, one is that uh, to just to say that you do get some interesting um, patterns for how the, um, how the, uh, the, the symbols are arranged on the cards. Here's the seven of cups and it's almost as if the six cups almost in a circle here with one in the middle. The other thing is that these images are so beautiful that again there's this huge variety in what the cups look like. They're all of the pattern um, that was popular throughout the late Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and, and, and beyond of um, a metal cup we're allowed to believe it's gold from the colouring and all that. Uh, so a, a gold cup, let's say, with a lid on it, a close-fitting lid. And the, these cups are are known to exist. You know, they're, they're in museums, they're in collections. These lidded cups. Um, but the variety of designs is phenomenal, and some of them have have little faces on. Uh, some of them are, are patterned in different ways great inventiveness gone into making these images. Um, they really are a pleasure just to flick through and, and look and, and just see the, the variety of the, the shapes and designs of the cups there. There is um, an interesting thing about the batons and swords pips too in that um, they're very much not of the pattern of the later Marseille decks. Um, you know that in Marseille you get simple patterns of, of crossed uh, cross batons and, and saws that curve around and cross at the top and bottom. Well, you don't get that here. Each baton in the suit is um, basically a, a, a tree branch, um, different colours, slightly different shapes, but basically the same the same tree branch repeated over and over. The swords are of this gorgeously deadly looking design. Um, nothing refined about these swords at all. These are meat cleavers basically. But of this particular design, curved blade, a uh, single edged blade, because the engraving seems to suggest that this edge is blunt, this edge is sharp. And with this kind of finger guard that I think was becoming popular throughout the 
the 16th and into the 17th century um, so you, you would hold a hin hilt and this this bit of metal here would would stop your fingers getting hurt from any incoming sword blows uh, I'm not quite sure what the dents or the holes in the blade are, are about but if again if you do an image search for um, European swords of this time say 16th to 17th century th this design will come up sooner or later there is um, a, a, an edition of this deck that's published by the company Civilixi and if you look on their website there's um, there's a lovely page that talks about the interpretation of the Tarot de Paris um, cards and the writer of that page is very keen for there to be um, an occult or esoteric interpretation of the cards and you, you can you can put that kind of interpretation on them if you want or not if you want um, and a, a really interesting point that they make on that web page is that in the swords and the batons in a lot of the cards you get this division between one set in the upper half of the card and one set in the lower half and sometimes with an item in between um, and they suggest an interpretation for this that that um, echoes the the maxim of you know as above so below that you you split the card in in two horizontally so that um, there's a uh, basically a, a heavenly half and an earthly half um, or a spiritual half and a physical half and you you then look at the numbers and disposition of the the symbols in in each half of the card so that's going towards a, an interesting way of interpreting the swords and the batons minors in the Tarot de Paris. That's really where I want to end. I've spent um, quite a long time over the summer looking at and studying this deck, um, searching around, seeing what sort of background and information I can get on it. It is fascinating. It's not that easy to get hold of. Um, the, the one of the cover cards in the pack says it's a limited edition but it doesn't say how many cards it's limited to um, I suspect there's probably quite a lot of them around but they don't seem to come up for sale very often I was very lucky to find this when I did it, it I expected to have it on my wish list for years possibly but it came up all of a sudden um, just at the beginning of the summer really pleased to have it I hope that some of what I've been saying about it is of use or of help to some people or at least that you've enjoyed flicking through these cards with me. Thanks for watching.